lost. Yep. All right. So, welcome everyone to our ninth global to local webinar uh, titled Beyond Trump, The Path to Real Change. Uh, my name is Sean Keller with Local Futures. And before we get started, I'd like to make sure that you can all hear me all right. So if you can hear me, please let me know by sending a message in the chat box in the upper right part of the screen. Uh, just say yes, or I can hear you, or something like that. Cool. Looks like most of you can hear me just fine. Uh, if you do run into any audio issues during the webinar, my colleague Isabel and I are on hand, and you can ask for our help by writing us a message in the chat box. So let's get started. Uh, at today's webinar, we're going to explore the bigger picture surrounding Donald Trump's election as US president, uh, the implications of his election, and how we can move forward with an agenda for real positive change. We have two wonderful speakers here to drive the discussion. Uh, first, we have Richard Heinberg, senior fellow of the Post Carbon Institute, one of the world's foremost advocates for a shift away from fossil fuels, and the author of 13 books on energy and environmental sustainability. And we also have Helena Norberg-Hodge, director of Local Futures, producer and co-director of the documentary The Economics of Happiness, and author of the book Ancient Futures, Learning from Ladakh. And we'll start with short introductions from each of our speakers, maybe five minutes or so apiece, just talking a little about their backgrounds and their work. And then we'll move into a 30 to 40 minute discussion period. And after that, we'll continue with a 45 minute question and answer period. So there's plenty of time to get your questions ready. Please type any questions you have into the chat box and you can submit questions anytime you want. We'll do our best to get through as many as possible during the Q&A. One final note, if your internet connection runs into trouble, you can also call in and listen to the webinar by phone. The phone numbers and instructions on how that works are included in your confirmation email or you can click the info button above the chat box. Um, with that, I'm going to make the video for our presenters nice and big and turn things over to them. OK, well, I guess I'll go first. Um, I'm very delighted to be uh, sharing the uh, virtual stage today with, uh, with Helen and Erberg Hodge. Helen and I have uh, known each other for quite some time. Uh, back in the early 1990s, I think it was probably 1992 or 1993, something like that, uh, ISEC was uh, just rolling out a, uh, some study group materials. And, uh, and my wife, Janet, and I were, uh, ran into that somehow. I don't know. This was pre-internet days and uh and uh registered to be a, a study group and i think we might have even been the first one or at least the first one in the u.s and that was just a, a delightful experience uh for i don't know months and months it might have gone on for two or three years using uh materials that she and, and others had developed to have uh, discussions in our home that eventually led to uh an appointment at a, a college locally, uh, New College of California, which unfortunately is no longer, uh, where I was asked to develop a program on culture, ecology, and sustainable community. And there, again, uh, Helena's materials came in very handy. Uh, and since 2008, I've been a senior fellow at Post Carbon Institute, which is a small nonprofit uh, think tank that as the, the name suggests, Post Carbon Institute mostly deals with the question of how uh, we're going to transition away from fossil fuels, why that's important, um, and, and so on. So um, uh, as Sean mentioned, I've, I've written a number of books related to that subject, uh, some having to do with oil depletion, fossil fuel depletion in general, one on uh, on the subject of global coal supplies, um, others mostly focused on, on petroleum. And also a book in uh, 2000, uh, 2011, I believe it was, called The End of Growth, uh, Adapting to Our New Economic Reality, where I talk about uh, some of the, the evidence that's been appearing in the last few years to suggest that uh, industrial societies are reaching the end of the, of the period of rapid 
economic expansion that was seen during the 20th century and we're entering a new economic era which uh, unfortunately uh, we're pretty poorly prepared for because uh, just about everyone in the, in the, in the uh, official policy arena it, it believes in growth above all things and you know uh, we, we can do things to address climate change as long as it doesn't affect global growth <laughs> but um, that's just one example. But uh, again, the, the evidence is that uh, the, the ground is shifting beneath us and, uh, and growth as we've known it is, uh, is, is slowing down and uh, for, for reasons that are uh, not particularly amenable to the kinds of, of policy uh, actions that, that most of our leaders have, have contemplated. I think we've bought ourselves a few years with some extraordinary efforts on the part of central banks and, and national governments with uh, quantitative easing and uh, massive uh, government uh, uh, infrastructure programs and so on. But, uh, but I, th that's really sort of a last ditch effort. And now comes Donald Trump. So here, here is a new uh, fact on the ground that commands our attention, and I think it's a it's a, a pretty significant one. Um, and I don't want to say too much now because these are just introductory remarks. But I think it's it's uh, great that we're taking some time now to talk about this because uh, <clears throat> the ascent of of Trump in the United States, uh, it, I think, is is going to have uh, uh, enormous impact globally. And and uh, and what what we do that about that here in the US, I think is, is a really important subject of conversation right now. So um, maybe that's enough for me just to start with, and, uh, and I look forward to, to talking more. Thank you, Richard, and I'm also delighted to have this chance to talk to you. And I, um, yeah, I'm, I do think you were one of the first of our study groups. Uh, it was called Roots of Change, and essentially, going back now, even further back, almost 40 years, we've been trying to say the same thing. And uh, we used to be called ISEC, now we're called Local Futures, because we've been arguing, making the case for the need for decentralization or localization as really the only way that human beings can adapt to living ecosystems in a genuinely sustainable way. Um, we see the centralization, the top-down structures, which have only been possible because of fossil fuels and the centralization that they allowed. And of course, um, that, that path, as, as you've been spelling out, is, is doomed uh, for many, many reasons. And we think that we do have an opportunity now, like never before, to, to really encourage this systemic shift away from a globalizing path to a localizing path. And um, we've been doing that through what I'm now calling big picture activism. We think it's vital that we try to understand the systemic nature of our crises. And there, you know, as I've been trying to say for a long time, once you recognize and once you can spell out really clearly that the same policies that have led to increased energy consumption, increased the gap between rich and poor, are the same policies that are threatening people's livelihoods, threatening their jobs, threatening their financial security. And I think that message that this energy intensive path, which is of course, the main reason for climate change, and the only reason for climate change, um, is absolutely structurally linked to a path that's destroying livelihoods, destroying people's ability to provide for themselves and their families. And I was witness um, to how this affects people in the, in the global south, in the villages of China, of India, of Africa, the destruction of people's livelihoods, which is accompanied by now also a system of psychological uh, pressure 
that essentially says if you live in a village, if you are working on the land, you are nobody, you're an anachronism. So we have a system that's simultaneously destroying livelihoods, the ability to provide for yourself and your families, and destroying self-esteem, self-respect, because it's promoting a monocultural consumer culture, urbanized, glamorous images. And what, what we're really wanting people to recognize is that this is a recipe for violence. It's a recipe for fundamentalism of all kinds. So for me, the rise of the Tea Party and now the rise of a certain Trump mentality um, in, in some areas of the United States, some of the Brexit votes in, in Europe, in, in the UK, and, and similar neo, also I shouldn't say similar because it's even worse when we're talking about the rise of neo-Nazi splinter groups, even in Scandinavia, where I come from. So for me, it's all part of the same package, the destruction of livelihoods and the destruction of identity is fueling fear and violence, fundamentalism. And of course, the fear is often addressed uh, to the outsiders who are coming in, the immigrants who are coming in, seeming to take your job. And so that's very much the picture in the industrialized countries. In the non-industrialized countries, the fear and the violence is often directed at another local group, another race, culture, uh, identity, even regional competition and hatred and fundamentalism grows. So I think, yeah, I think the most important thing, the biggest task is to try to get that bigger picture out to show why your identity and your job is threatened and what we can do about it. And I do see that there is potential there and, and we feel it's really important that we do everything we can to show where those initiatives that are fundamentally about rebuilding local economies that allow for local self-esteem, for local empowerment, for much more job-rich economies, um, how we have many, many examples of how well they work. Amazingly, we have these examples because they're operating in a climate that is constantly pressuring in the opposite direction. And above all, we still have remnants of traditional ways of doing things that, that show how much better things can work when there is more local, when local knowledge systems are allowed to survive and when local interdependence helps people to recognize that we are all connected, that we are all one, and that uh, yeah, collaboration born of interdependence is the way forward. Um, but we, I probably said enough as an introduction. We, in, in Local Futures, we also, um, we will be on the study group materials, which we still have. We've tried to put things together in a, in a shorter way. So our film, The Economics of Happiness, is a very speedy overview of the issues I just tried to uh, cover. Um, and we try to do it from a global perspective because we think that one of the biggest problems we face is that people are tending to look at things from a national lens and they're not looking up enough to understand the process of globalization. And maybe as an introduction then to getting on to talk about Trump, I'd like to say that, you know, there are many, many you know, issues now that are so urgent and so important. Perhaps one of the most important is to drive home the message that the trade treaties that were brought in as part of the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, when they were set up, this process of trade and finance deregulation was brought in, in the form of something called the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Now that agreement, which was being really, I am quite convinced, in fact, I've known some of them, was being promoted by idealistic politicians because the idea was that to avoid another world war, to avoid another depression, we needed to integrate all of the world's economic activity. And the way to do that was just, you know, set up this world bank that is going to have an impact across
across the world, creating debt around the world, and this process of trade and finance deregulation. And that was this idea, of course, was brought onto the table with big global banks and businesses at the side of government. And over the last, particularly the last three decades, what has escalated massively is the power of these global, globally active banks and corporations. Many of them are registered in the US, but the US policies have become the political empire the military to create global wealth, to create billionaires in China and Mexico and around the world. It's not, the policies have had nothing to do with defending, with genuinely defending American prosperity. And good luck to Trump now with his, uh, with his cabinet and with what he's trying to do, you know, to, to create jobs for America. <clears throat> uh, we, we need to recognize really that the most important thing that's happened over the last year or two is that there has been a people's grassroots movement rejecting these trade treaties. That for us in local futures is incredibly hopeful and we must make it very clear that that resistance to TPP and to TTIP has not come from Trump, has not come from Hillary Clinton, has not even come from Bernie Sanders. It's come from people's movements, particularly environmentalists linking hands with trade unions. <clears throat> and that resistance is what we need to build on. We, we see that as one of the primary uh, ways forward, accompanied by a very clear message and documented evidence of the countless initiatives growing around the world to strengthen local economies, local businesses, local interdependence, um, and how that those post-carbon, you know, um, localization or what you often call relocalization initiatives are bearing fruit. That's very, very considerable. So I hope people will look at our series on our website called Planet Local, where we document examples of these localization initiatives. So we're not coming with a message which is simply, or oh, wouldn't it be a good idea? We actually now have evidence that, and you know, we have proof that it works. Um, so over to you, Richard, because I, I um, you know, right. I, we may want to start with more of a, of an, an, a look at Trump and what we see, what we see coming. Right. Well, it, it's certainly true that uh, Trump um, touched into a, a nerve in the American psyche with regard to uh, his his critique of of globalization, uh, uh, criticizing particularly uh, NAFTA, but also the TPP, uh, and his criticisms were ones that I think would resonate with folks who you know, remember back to the battle in Seattle back in 1999, uh, talking about how Americans have lost jobs due to increased uh, global competition, uh, um, kind of race to the bottom for, uh, for employment globally. Um, and also he was criticizing uh, neoconservative foreign policy of the last, uh, you know, really uh, 16 years, uh, U.S. You know, invading country after country, especially in the Middle East, overthrowing um, this regime and that, and leaving a, a mess in its place that then, you know, festers and, and creates even more uh, situations that seemingly can only be solved with, uh, with more invasions, more, um, more of the same. So his criticisms of, of these things found, uh, you know, uh, a, a very um, welcoming audience uh, across much of the United States. Um, but it has to be said, uh, this, this kind of, of, of populist message was not one that, that uh, uh, had a, a co really coherent critique or agenda. Uh, Trump seemed to be sort of picking up threads here and there and trying to tie them together into some kind of semblance of, of a 
uh, a coherent agenda, but you know, it's he's certainly hasn't uh, produced any kind of document that that ties all of this together. And if you look at who he is uh, as as a person, you know, he's, he's basically a a, a, a a businessman and and one who has uh, founded his career on uh, things like Trump University, which you know just he just settled a twenty five million dollar fraud suit for that. Uh, he he he's lied and and cheated uh, not only business uh, associates but workers uh, for years and years. So to think that he's somehow on the side of of the little person in the U.S. who's who's uh, being uh, impacted by by globalization sort of stretches credulity. And now we see who he's appointing to his cabinet, uh, Secretary of State uh, Rex Tillerson, the uh, CEO of ExxonMobil, the person he's appointing to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is the very is a climate denier, the very antithesis of what that what that agency is theoretically all about. I could I could go on and on. And retired, very belligerent retired generals and 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 so on. So uh, I understand that uh, many people have great hopes for Trump uh, because he's saying things that needed to be said. In, with regard to his criticisms of globalization and, and neoconservative foreign policy. But what they're likely to get, I think, is something very different. Trump has uh, not only a narcissistic, but a very authoritarian personality. He doesn't listen to anyone else. He's not listening even to the CIA's daily uh, uh, briefings. He, um, he, he thinks he's a smart person and doesn't, doesn't need to learn anything. Uh, uh, and he's he's pretty obsessed with his his own image and and how much people like him, uh, and uh, and so he's appointing people who you know are are he he hopes I think will will just be uh, you know uh, flattering mirrors of his very very lofty self image. Uh, it, I think it doesn't look good. This is uh, this is a, a pretty bad situation for the United States. Uh, majority of Americans did not vote for Donald Trump, and there's going to be a big backlash. I've I've, uh, I've written recently that there, you know, everyone knows that there's the the uh, Newton's third law. Uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, Donald Trump represents a a, a really uh, enormous shift in uh, U.S. government policy and, and the flavor, the shape, the uh, personality of government, and there is going to be a very powerful reaction to that. Uh, and and I, I think Trump is going to react to that reaction. So we're, I think we're we're in for for some very disturbing times here in this country. The, there's a, a very strong possibility of a much uh, more authoritarian and intrusive. Uh, federal government, and uh, and that's likely to uh, express itself in opposition to what many local communities are trying to do with regard to climate change, with equity, with uh, uh, providing shelter for for poor people and immigrants, and so on. Uh, it, it seems to me that that local resistance is actually going to be a, a hallmark of the coming. Trump years. So when we think about localism in the context of the Trump administration, much of that uh, localism, I think, is going to be j just, uh, you know, <laughs> manning the barricades, if you will, <laughs> or trying to throw sand in the gears. I and mean, this is nothing new in American politics. There's been, uh, uh, well, the, the federal government and state and local governments have been odds at odds on all sorts of issues for a very long time, uh, going back to the Civil War and, and before. So in a sense, that's not new, but I think this adds uh, uh, a, a whole new level of, uh, of, of that kind of, of conflict. But of course, if, if we just think of, 
of localism in terms of, of resistance, then the best we can accomplish is just to keep things where they are. And I think even that would be quite an accomplishment. So wh when we think of localism in the context of Trump, I think we have to get beyond thinking just of local resistance to what we can build in terms of alternatives. So you wanted and, to and say I something. Think, uh, well, I was just going to say that when you talk about the uh, often conflict between local governments and national governments, you see, you see that worldwide. And you, you remember all those mayors, 120 some mayors who wanted to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. You know, whereas the national leaders were not willing. That was happening in the United States already. And we see, we do see now, we're doing quite a lot of work in South Korea, where, by the way, it looks at the moment as though our sort of people who are a network of 50 mayors who are uh, both environmentally and socially conscious and trying to pursue policies diametrically opposed to really the policies that all national governments had fallen prey to. Uh, because whether left or right, whether the Scandinavian seemingly, you know, relatively enlightened governments or not, for the last three decades they have just been following the demands of global capital in the direction of this neoliberal systemic agenda that destroys jobs, drives up not just CO2 emissions, but every form of environmental destruction. You know, the use of rare minerals, you know, at every, every point, deforestation, you know, the, it's just a disaster, not just genetic engineering, but the chemical load increasing. So we've had policies that as a systemic economic direction have been disastrous, and we've just got to get beyond the sort of theater that's been playing out of left-right, where the left generally has definitely had better intentions, even at the level of political representation at the national level, there have been better intentions, but there's not been a clearly articulated rejection of this form of growth, which by the way, we keep having to remind people that growth has meant this steady increase in, in essentially poverty going up now you know, to the middle classes and even beyond. When we look at how many hours people have to work to pay for their mortgage, to pay for their house, to pay for their food, to pay for education and healthcare, we are seeing a rise in, you know, people working harder and longer hours worldwide. You know, it's happening now in, in Beijing, it's happening in India, it's, and, and uh, you, you have a concentration of jobs in mega megalopolis urban centers where the you know lifestyle the standard of living has declined massively you know with the air pollution with the crime with the breakdown of community and at the same time in those really often horrendous slums or slum like conditions the house prices skyrocketing so, you know, we, we, it's creating a completely, uh, you know, the 99% the of being marginalized. And, and we estimate that the drivers of the deregulation, which has given banks and corporations more and more power, more and more ability to influence, if not shape, policy at the national level, including in my native country of Sweden, uh, that, that, you know, that really what we're talking about is blindness from my point of view it's blindness from the grassroots to the top of the systemic nature of what we're up against so trump you say is going to lead to a reaction and for us you know the idea that it's better to have a wolf in wolf's clothing as some people have been saying rather than a wolf in sheep's clothing like hillary we may be i mean i'm i'm not I can't say this with conviction, but I'm hoping that because we have a wolf in wolf clothing, who is clearly so, so dangerous, that we are going to really be able to see a very strong and powerful movement that is not just a reaction against, but as you were saying, that articulates clearly where do we need to go? What are the fundamental 
structures and shifts that we need to make. And, and I would argue that we need even a country as big as the US needs to ally itself with the international movement, needs to come from a global perspective. If we can clearly spell out the need for localizing from a global perspective, we're able to move beyond the corporate propaganda, which tries to um, you know, argue that localization, uh, local organic food, you know, nice, friendly, ecological products, that's all elitist, it's all these wealthy people who don't care about the poor. That's all coming out of, that's emanated from corporate think tanks. And we need to be providing the big picture and say, wait a minute, our taxes are subsidizing the fossil fuel based corporate path that makes food from 10,000 miles away often cheaper than food from one mile away. And that that, that uh, madness is a global problem. You know, we have in, in Kenya, you know, butter from Germany costing less than local butter. It's a global problem. Um, and it's all, at every step of the way, it's benefiting the accumulation of wealth in fewer and fewer hands. So the widening gap between rich and poor comes from this globalizing path and that shortening the distances and rebuilding um, more localized systems, which of course it's not, it's not an absolute, it's a question of a process, it's a question of a shift in direction, but that's a, a very clear path that could bring multiple benefits. And I, I just so hope that we can get this message out in a, in a holistic and convincing way. And I don't know if you agree, Richard, but I, I see as one of the biggest problems is how do we get uh, this information, the reality of the information, the things that are going on around the world that are genuinely positive, and even within the United States, you know, things like Detroit, where there are, you know, of course, everything isn't perfect, but there have been very, very inspiring local food initiatives that are genuinely rebuilding community, self-respect, and the most vital economy of all, which is the food economy. You know, that's the one we really need to focus on. Um, and we need to get the, that information out. All right. Well, I think part of this is, uh, at least in the United States, going to be a matter of uh, uh, reaching out uh, beyond party politics, because, uh, frankly, I think the country is, is extremely polarized and obsessed right now with party politics. And that's, yeah. uh, it, it, it wastes a lot of energy that could be better spent. Uh, I, I published an article. Uh, I published an article a few days ago called uh, Localism in the Age of Trump, where I said a lot of things that I, I, I just said a few minutes ago. And um, one of the responses I got online was from a, a, a Trumpista, you know, a supporter of Trump. And it was, it was really nasty, uh, I have to say. And, uh, and the, the guy was accusing me of saying or thinking things that, you know, are completely foreign to me. But um, you know, the assumption, I think, was that because I was criticizing Trump, therefore, uh, I'm a, you know, staunch supporter of o Obama and Hillary Clinton and all of the policies that, that they, uh, they, they've pursued for all these years. And nothing could be further from the truth. Um, it, I, I, many of, of these folks actually, as, as we were talking about earlier, are, are responding to, you know, uh, criticisms and, and, uh, and horrible impacts, local and global impacts of the kinds of policies that, that we've been seeing from both neoliberal and neoconservative uh, forces in, in, in government. And we do need a change. The question is, is, is Donald Trump going to, going to provide it? And, uh, and pro probably, <laughs> I think the overwhelming likelihood is he's, he's going to lead us in exactly the wrong direction. But nevertheless, the, that understanding that, that has been aroused in so much of the population that we have been going in a, 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 a wrong direction 
could, I think, be the basis for conversations at the local level about not not just you know what what to do with, uh, in national politics, but about what to do in our own towns and counties and states to uh, to solve the the very real problems that we're seeing with regard to employment and housing, climate change, infrastructure, water, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the, many of these problems are best dealt with locally anyway. I mean, we here in the United States, the, the most innovative and far reaching climate policies we've seen have not been uh, from the federal government, but they've been uh, from place, well, some states like California, but also uh, many counties and cities, uh, mayors, organizations working on uh, climate change and all of these other issues, I, I could say the same thing. And very often these uh, are not, these, these uh, initiatives are not starting at the state house at the, from from legislators they're starting at the grassroots just as we've seen with the local food movement this isn't this isn't something that that happens as a result of you know uh, mayors and city councils deciding we should have local food it's happening as a result of of people getting together in farmers markets and and uh, uh, helping their neighbors to uh, begin to grow and distribute more food locally and and so on uh, where we're seeing more cooperative organizations and institutions, uh, co cooperative banks, otherwise known as here in the U.S. as, as credit unions, uh, where we're seeing um, local efforts to invest more money locally rather than just seeing all of our, uh, you know, retirement in, uh, savings going to Wall Street. Uh, all of all of those efforts are happening locally, and I think. They, those kinds of efforts would be welcomed as much by folks who voted for Donald Trump as by folks who voted for Bernie Sanders. So if we can get beyond this super polarized, heated two-party system uh, kind of conversation to talking about what we really care about as human beings, as friends and neighbors, then I think there's the, the potential for uh, for us to actually make some some good things happen here in the United States and elsewhere. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm talking more in the context of the United States because uh, that's where I live, and also because Trump is is a, a pretty uh, you know uh, he, he's a phenomenon that it's it's very difficult to talk about anything else, which of course is suits him just fine as a as a narcissist. He's, narcissist, he's quite happy to have everyone talking about him 24 seven. But I think the, the only way we're going to get to talking about something else is by doing exactly what I was saying a minute ago, by, by talking among ourselves about what actually needs to be done in our local communities and then going out and doing it without reference necessarily to what's happening uh, in Washington. Well, I would, I would just slightly... Uh maybe modify that a bit in that I think what we're trying to encourage is the understanding of the fundamental systemic damage through a globalizing economic path, which has brought, brought with it an over-specialized reductionist thinking, which has brought with it this extreme centralization of power. It's brought with it structurally the growing gap between rich and poor, and the how the shift in direction towards localizing is the way forward. Now, we would like to see that message disseminated widely through every possible channel, and we would like to see that linked to the global discussion, to an international discussion, because part of the way that people are getting stuck particularly in the Anglo world, in the English-speaking countries, England, Australia, the US, Canada, they still believe that Scandinavia is fine, for instance. And that keeps people stuck in a, a left-right, um, what I see as a political theater now, because in the meanwhile, you know, things are going very rapidly in this global corporate direction. 
And we all, you know, we need to recognize that we have a financial casino that is driving all of this. And where I might differ with you, Richard, is I'm, I'm very concerned that this end of industrial, the industrial economy, which has already translated into a financial uh, an information economy, a service economy, that that could keep growing really until people's movements prevent the, the hideous destruction that is wreaking on the world. So, I, you know, we're allowing the artificial creation of money essentially out of thin air to allow quadrillions to circulate globally. And th those big funds are looking for quick, big profit. They are, they cannot deal with the, you know, the mom and pop shop at a local level. They can't begin to deal basically with diversity. They, they're supporting the monoculture of Walmart, the artificial monoculture of genetic engineering, they can't deal with the real diversity on the ground. So you have a structural relationship between the generation of money out of thin air and the eradication of, of biodiversity and cultural diversity. So that's all very destructive, but the, the fact that there is still so much more health at the level of local ecosystems than, than we realize. Climate change, no doubt, is extremely, extremely worrying. It may not be as catastrophic as many scientists are now assuming. Uh, we don't know. We have to be humble. I think that, that could be helpful. But, but anyway, we, we need to get this message out. And I would argue that, yes, we want to take action at the local level, but part of that action is to try to support the community radio networks to the extent that they exist, to try to get the message out beyond the local. And a lot of that will be about sharing the stories that are successful. You were mentioning the local banking. There's also the ballet and other ballet, the Business Alliance for living, local living economies and other similar business alliances that have made great contributions. There is the Transition Town Network, um, which has reached out to uh, thousands of communities worldwide. There's also, most heartening of all, is the local food movement in its various manifestations, from the permaculture movement, which is extremely grassroots, but actually gaining momentum worldwide at a scale that I find incredibly inspiring. There is the eco-village movement, which is also now coming into its own, the global eco-village movement. Because it's global, it is now linking up to the villages of the global south. So we recently participated in an eco-village conference in China. You know, all of these things are small, but they are so, um, they essentially represent what we call a solution multiplier. It's a systemic shift that brings with it psychological, social, ecological, and economic benefits. So I'm not, I don't want to, I probably sound overly optimistic when I, when I talk about these initiatives, but it's certainly what keeps me going, being in touch with the grassroots, and being able to document, to actually see from year to year that there is that positive growth from the bottom up. And I would urge all our listeners, if they're feeling demoralized and depressed, to make more of an effort to find out what's going on at the grassroots level. Perhaps starting with their local area, but going beyond that, because it's when you see it happening at a global level that you gain you know, a sense that there is this, um, above all, what it's testimony to is that human beings are not by nature greedy and violent. We need to remember that the neoliberal agenda thrives on putting the message out that this is all happening because we're all greedy by nature, as though the individuals are driving consumerism. 
when it's actually the unfortunate development of a corporate system that pushes consumerism, even on our, you know, three-year-olds. And so the, the, um, the message that we can gain through being in touch with the grassroots and the localization movement is actually a, a great joy at seeing how people, even in adversity, are demonstrating wisdom, perseverance, goodwill, and that they are able to cooperate. But, you know, having said all that, we are in a very dire situation. I have been saying for a while now that we are heading, you know, either towards overt fascism in the industrialized countries or building a people's movement that understands that our fixation on the political theater of one or two individuals as being allowing that to be what counts, uh, you know, is absolutely wrong. We have to build the politics through the people's movement. And I, I want to, before we turn it over to discussion, I want to be sure that people have heard about the Five Star Movement in Italy. The Five Star Movement in Italy is one of the most inspiring examples of how a people's movement in six years, building from zero to six years later, going into parliament, taking half of Berlusconi's vote. Berlusconi was a Trump, a Trump, literally. I mean, uh, even including the womanizing, the corruption, big business, own the media in Italy, a people's movement was able to build up in six years enough to go into parliament and take half of his vote, take 30% of the whole vote. And they have been able to stay there from 2012 without going into coalition. They refused to go into coalition. And they've been able to stay in parliament and now are growing and have essentially ousted the current government, which is supposedly left, but totally neoliberal. Don't believe anything you read about them in the media. The media, first of all, has silenced them so that most people have never heard of them. Uh, unlike Syriza in Greece and Podemos in Spain, which we got to hear about because they did not threaten the corporate global system. They were playing the old left-right Gain still firmly committed to growth, uh, you know, corporate growth, even though not in quite the same excessive way. But so anyway, five star movement, please do look that up. But you have to look to the grassroots to find the truth about them. You'll find there's a woman mayor in Rome from the five star movement, and you'll find it very encouraging. So with that, I think, question? yeah, I think we should turn it over to some questions. We've received a lot already, um, right. but let me see. Yeah, I've been watching see. some of them go by. Yeah. It's a very good um, discussion. Definitely. Um, I guess I'll start with, start with the, the first one. <laughs> um, how, so the question is, how can we foster this transition to localization? How can we move gracefully and inclusively from such an oppressive system to a holistic, sustainable, community-oriented society? And possibly the most crucial part right now, when we're facing a Trump presidency, how can we shift the minds of those with the most vested interest in the current institutions? Well, it's uh, big questions, and you know, I I think we've touched on on some of that already. But um, as as Helen has been saying, I think I think it is important to uh, have uh, solidarity with uh, other folks in other other places who are engaged in the same kind of work internationally as as well as nationally. Uh, the the um, the the, the problem with hyperlocalism, of course, is that uh, you lose sight of uh, of the of the larger issues. Uh, so definitely uh, forge alliances with and keep in touch with the the the, the, the larger uh, discussions that are occurring uh, internationally. But 
uh, also at the same time, actually roll up your sleeves and find out who is doing what in your in your local community. I mean, it, if if you only pay attention to what's going on uh, in in movements in Italy or Spain or uh, uh, Northern Europe or or Australia or where else, and you're living in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, <laughs> it, you know that it it might be uh, interesting, but what what really is going to matter for you and your family and your community is what you can do right there in Jackson, Mississippi. And interestingly enough, there's a lot going on in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a very vital community in terms of, of localism and alternatives, and um, and so where if folks look around and and go out into their community and and pay attention, they'll find people to work with. And I think you know, looking at some of these movements um, and their websites, the permaculture movement, generally the the, the local food movement doesn't yet see itself as a movement. We see it as a global movement of rebuilding the connections between farmers and consumers. Very important that we not buy into the idea that just urban ag is the way forward. That's not how we can feed ourselves. But the reconnection between the city and the countryside is something that's happening worldwide. And it's often supported by movements like the biodynamic movement, the permaculture movement, the slow food movement, um, and of course the um, transition towns are now doing more and more with local food. Uh, so if you look at, at these movements, you will see uh, an array of very inspiring examples and you will see ways perhaps Paradoxically, you might be able to connect with something in your local area by going to, to one of these websites or getting information and, and you'll find that there is something going on in your area. But again, I want to stress, because we're, we're, you know, we are in a time of crisis and we are, we are really facing, as I say, overt fascism. Uh, not just in the U.S., but in, in other countries, if we don't, uh, you know, wake up to what, what is going on, what's causing this madness on every side, as I said. Uh, so we, we do need to keep that uh, more international and national perspective, but in touch with the, the people's movements there. And we have to look for the honest, and reliable voices. We have to be activists in what I call, you know, education as activism, big picture activism, uh, because so many of the good voices are not, not even on the scene in the more, uh, you know, intelligent left, where there are some very good voices, but most of them out of touch with the grassroots, particularly the global grassroots. Most, you know, people have not heard of groups like Via Campesina, for instance. Via Campesina is the biggest social movement in the world. And yet most thinking people, really good people, have never heard of them. Why? Because with between two and three hundred million farmers, they were among the earliest to to form, you know, warning bells about the global trade treaties. They formed in opposition to trade treaties that were everywhere destroying small farmers. That's why we haven't heard from them. That's why we haven't heard about the Five Star Movement, because they, they oppose this globalizing power. And um, let's, let's also, um, yeah, anyway, so we need to be activists in looking for the information. David Corton, if you don't know that name, please look at his books. David Corton and Yes Magazine. Uh, you'll find lots of good information there. I see someone asking about, isn't the inner work, the inner transition, the most important work? I think there's a, there's a tendency oh. from our point of view yeah. for people, Sorry, did you want to say something, Richard? 
Well, I, I just I did want to say um, that I think your point of uh, of creating alliances between uh, urban and and rural folks is really important, particularly here in the United States, because uh, the a lot of the energy for Trump has come from uh, rural areas and small towns, which really feel cut adrift. They feel like they've just been left uh, put up to to hang in the in the wind, while all of the all of the goodies, all of the interesting stuff is is flowing to the the big urban centers, whether it's San Francisco or New York or or Chicago. And so, uh, if you look at a, an electoral map, the places that voted Democratic are little blue islands in the middle of a red sea, you know. And again, it's not. Uh, this is this is not uh, uh, an, an encouragement to uh, you know, turn the conversation back to party politics, but it's it's a recognition that this this polarization is going to continue until we address this the fact that rural culture has been on the decline and under the gun in this country for, for decades. And we have to do something about that. And the best way to start is, is locally, you know, uh, find out who, who's growing your food in, in, in your region. Who are, who are the, the, the local people that uh, in, in rural settings that you can form alliances with. And, and again, this, this could be, the, 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 uh, it's getting beyond party politics and talking about what your actual interests are. And I love the, uh, the examples that we witness because we try to encourage the setting up of farmers markets, community supported agriculture schemes and so on now for almost 30 years. And we've done it all over the world. I mean, we were involved in the US in this in the early days. Um, and what we're seeing is again. I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm not saying that this is yet saving the world, but again and again, what we see are examples of how precisely what Richard said is happening. You have farmers who were led to believe that they've got to produce standard products with no blemishes on them, and they were pressured by big centralized markets, big business to produce these standard, perfect looking products and always pressured to keep lowering their prices. And as one farmer said to me, you know, I, I grew up as a farmer and, and we, you know, we felt like serfs. After you started the farmer's market, we've entered another, it's like another galaxy. What's happening is that many of the consumers who shop at the farmer's market are, are greenies who those farmers were previously very prejudiced against. Now they're so grateful that those greenies don't care if there are some blemishes on the apples or the potatoes. They don't care if they're different sizes. In fact, they recognize that if there is that diversity and if there is a sign that this has been grown more naturally, this is a good thing. And there are the most wonderful conversations and there's a convergence of left and right occurring over those food stalls. And we see it in country after country. Um, so, and partly what we've also seen is that in the cities, often those people who are voting left are, are not alert to the key issues. So they have also been voting for globalization. Uh, they've been voting for the trade treaties whereas it's been the rural populations who have, because they've seen how it destroys particularly farming livelihoods with small shops and the small everything, small communities, the post office is closed down, the hospital is closed down, so they have been more resistant. And now we have the Trumps and the Le Pens and the Farages in, in England co-opting that voice and that vote um, into a very dangerous direction. So we, we, have, we have an opportunity now like, like never before. Well, not an opportunity. We, we have a mandate like never before to really um, wake up and spread the message uh, as rapidly as we can. And I, there was someone asking about this spiritual Trump's work. 
and I worry that there can be too much of a specialization uh, where people end up focusing on transition. And the outer transition influences the inner transition. Even what I was saying now, it's the simple fact of farmers and consumers meeting and having a discussion over the, those items that are being sold can lead to very major transition in healthy relationships. So we are very keen to encourage the inner and the outer simultaneously, but not get into this mindset which says without inner peace, there will not be peace in the world. Uh, so there has been a, a rather large contingent of new age spiritual movements that have unfortunately not only been apolitical, but often anti-political. And we feel that the political, as we understand it, is really about changing the I to a we. Once we start connecting with people at the local level and jointly trying to do something, we can achieve a lot more. And definitely do pay attention to the tools that the spiritual movements are providing. The, the meditation, the yoga. It sounds like your audio is breaking up a little, Helena. The breathing tools. I think, well, they can it's okay. bring, you know, the, the spiritual tools. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. We should move on to some other questions soon. Just, yeah. But, but yeah, finish, yeah, finish your thought first. Yeah. When the spiritual tools are absolutely essential, particularly today, because they can provide you with the calm and the peace of mind that you need to look clearly and honestly at what's going on. Cool. So um, the next question actually is a follow-up to something that Richard was saying. Uh, earlier, and you both talked about it a little bit about um, urban local or, or urban uh, rural alliances, um, or just you know localization in rural areas in general, bringing them in to to things. Um, question is, do you have any good examples of this kind of alliance? Um, and also, uh, kind of related to that, what can be done outside of the world of agriculture, farmers markets, CSAs, that kind of thing. Right. Well, most of the examples are in the uh, uh, in the local food arena, um, uh, you know, supporting your local farmer and so on. But I think it's it's also helpful to look at land use issues and uh, and environmental issues where uh, land is is being impacted by development, gravel mining. Uh, uh, con road construction, all of these sorts of things. Um, these these are often issues that impact uh, rural people, and they can be contentious. Uh, so I think it's before wading in, it's helpful for for uh, urban people to uh, try to understand these issues from the perspective of the rural people who are who are being impacted and make connections with those people as much as possible before uh, uh, before you know weighing in with uh, you know petitions and and marching on the city hall and or the state house and, and so on because if we can if we can uh, uh, get a, a coalition of rural and and uh, urban people addressing issues like these then uh, much more likely to succeed, whereas otherwise the the, the, the the gravel miners or the fossil fuel companies or uh, whoever we're up against uh, inevitably turn it into a uh, an oppositional situation where it's it's always the you know the the urban environmentalists against the you know the 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 good rural folks who are just trying to uh, uh, make an honest living, and you know that's a that's really a no-win situation. You know you might you might win the battle, but your what happens in the end is you alienate a lot of people who end up 
uh, <laughs> as we've just seen, voting for Donald Trump. Um, and Richard, have you, yeah. have you had um, much experience with slow money movement? Uh, yes, uh, my, I just went out a little for, for a second there, uh, so I didn't hear the whole question, but... Um, and I wonder if you've had much experience with the slow money movement, because that's yes. a very good one too, I think. It is a good one, and one of our post-carbon fellows is Michael Schumann, who's written a whole bunch of really important books on, on the topic of you know, local economies and, and slow money. And actually, we worked uh, with him to uh, publish a, a book called Local Dollars, Local Sense, which is all about making it easier for people to invest their retirement. Oh. Have we, have we lost? We lost third. Yeah. Well, maybe I um, should mention also that Michael works closely with us in Local Futures. We're building up an international alliance for localization. And again, I want to stress how important I think it is that we remain international in our thinking. So we're not promoting some kind of closed, narrow localization. And one of the things we've been doing is organizing international conferences around the theme of the economics of happiness. And Michael participates in those. Yeah, and this is a book that we also promote, Local Dollars, Local Sense. Um, and the, again, you know, when you, when you look at those books and you look at the examples, it is, yeah, very inspiring. It works, localization works. It's a question of building up enough of a critical mass of people, which is why we have to be reaching out to get more people involved. And as Richard was saying, between the urban and the rural is particularly important. But Richard, what about local energy initiatives? Have you been in touch with some of these, you know, the projects, uh, you know, getting a community hydro scheme going or a local windmill? Yes, I'm, I'm just looking for the book that we co-published on exactly that topic. <laughs> it's called Power from the People uh, by yeah. a, a Vermont author named Greg Paul. And, and he talk, he, you know, uh, has many, many very encouraging stories about uh, local organizations doing exactly that. Uh, another big success story is um, uh, local and regional uh, utilities. Now, there's been a change in the law in California and other states are, are adopting that community choice aggregation, which makes it possible for uh, communities to band together to create their own um, municipally owned or public or you know, public, truly publicly owned. I don't mean shareholder, but I mean uh, um, owned by the, the community. Uh, utilities. And so here in Sonoma County, we have Sonoma County Clean Power. And uh, when, when it first started out, there was a question of you know, how many people are going to sign on to this. Well, all, as it's turned out, all of the cities in Sonoma County and I think 97 percent of, of power customers in the county have signed on to Sonoma Clean Power. It's same things happening in Marin County and and counties throughout California. And, and the, the great thing about this is, first of all, it's it's cheaper because you're not paying uh, uh, investors uh, and uh, uh, high paid executives, but also it's not just about the bottom line anymore. It's not just about making, uh, making a profitable business. It's also about you know, what kind of power do we want? Uh, and with Sonoma Clean Power, Marin and so on, the, what, what folks want is more renewable electricity. So these organizations prefer high wind thermal power, and uh, and everyone's happy. Uh, they've been a huge success. So I guess that goes some way to answering uh, the next question, which was, um, do you see opportunities to use tools available under late capitalism that will perhaps be privileged in a Trump administration 
to use building slash land ownership and finance to begin to take local control of energy production and consumption. Um, yeah, I guess that, that addresses that somewhat. Right, but yeah, I don't know yeah. If you I have mean, anything else local, you want to add to that? If you want local energy, it's, uh, it's almost certainly going to be, uh, in well, the vast majority of places, it's going to be renewable because fossil fuels are highly geographically concentrated. Um, you know, yes, Texas, uh, part of Southern California, there's coal in in uh, Wyoming and West Virginia, but you know the vast majority of places around the country, if if they're going to uh, focus on local energy, are going to be focusing on um, hydro, micro hydro, possibly geothermal, but most likely wind and solar. Uh, and uh, you know these are these are sources of energy that are not depletable. You know, my using solar power doesn't uh, doesn't deplete what future generation generations can use, or what somebody in some other part of the, of the country can use. So it's a it's a different economic paradigm, uh, and uh, it, and again, it's a it's a much more local paradigm because it makes sense to use it as as close to where it's generated as possible to minimize uh, transmission losses. Um, and people generally are in favor of renewable energy due to our reliance on fossil fuels. And this is just as true of Trump voters as it is of, of Bernie Sanders voters. So here again is an issue that can recross party lines and, and, uh, and make uh, alliances within local communities to, um, to, to you know, shift the ballgame. Half of the people in your community may not agree that climate change is, exists or that it's caused by human beings. I mean, we have a, we're going to have a new president who thinks that nobody knows if climate change is really happening or not, which is you know, pretty outrageous and ridiculous. But it doesn't matter. You know, if, if communities are investing in renewable energy and in, and in energy uh, uh, conservation, it doesn't matter whether they say it's because of climate change or something else. That's what matters is what we do. And also, I want to add that generally supporting small local business, supporting farmers, as well as these energy initiatives, these are all things that I would actually say probably Trump voters are more supportive of than the typical urban uh, people who might have voted for Hillary. But, you know, as I say, the, the keeping small businesses alive and and um, local food supporting farmers that's definitely something that appeals to what we often call conservatives with a small c uh, you know they're, they're the small chaps and unfortunately they are being trained to look at government as the enemy and they want government out of the way now that comes into a, another issue which is that because of the trade treaties that have deregulated, in other words, given more freedom to global business, those global businesses have lobbied governments to bring in regulations that they know destroy their, their local and national counterparts. Now, that's, that's not the only place the regulations have come from. But what we have to be aware of is that even many of the regulations that we will have fought for, environmental protection measures, social protection measures, have affected the place-based businesses, the local and national businesses, but not affected the global players who have had exactly the opposite. The I guess I fell out there. So I think so. business, particularly in the last three decades, have had more freedom while local businesses have been overregulated. And it's led to these conservatives with a small C wanting government out of the way. And we need to bring in a the clearer analysis. And as a pioneer of the localization movement, I should mention I've done a an overview of a short booklet that lays out these issues that I see Anja Lundbeck has put up on the um, 
chat box there. I hope people will look at that. Um, we have a, a couple questions about a similar, of a similar bent. Um, so we've been talking a lot about localizing economies and, and small business and things like that. But uh, a couple people are asking, you know, is, is that enough? Or, is, or can you speak about the need to power down, quote unquote, and, and re really drastically reduce consumption? Uh, we have someone else asking whether capitalism itself is the problem and, um, you know, whether, whether using institutions that are fundamentally built on destruction of the environment and systems of inequality is at all helpful. Um, I don't know if you, if you want to address any, any part of that. Yeah, I'd like to say power down a few years ago, but more recently, uh, I worked with uh, another of our post carbon fellows, David Fridley of um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories to uh, examine the transition to renewable energy, what, what would be involved with that, whether, whether the likely outcomes and so on. And we found you know, a lot of ways in which solar and wind are, uh, are, are, are growing, the costs are coming down, lots of opportunities. But also our conclusion was that uh, realistically, uh, a solar and wind economy is going to look very different from the fossil fuel economy of today. We will probably have much less total energy to use, and especially in the transportation sector, because uh, oil is in many ways the ideal transportation uh, fuel, and especially in shipping and aviation, uh, also trucking, it's going to be a very, very difficult transition. So we're looking at uh, almost forced localization from the standpoint of, uh, of reduced energy in transportation, not just of people, but of stuff. And we transport about over 10 times more stuff than we do people in terms of weight. So that means, you know, we, we really need to rethink our economies, localizing them and also downsizing our levels of consumption not just of energy, but also of materials. All the stuff that's flowing through our economy, the raw materials, uh, all of that gets mined and processed, and all of that uses energy. And much of that energy is going to be hard to substitute with renewable electricity. So, uh, so cutting down on energy usage and cutting down on consumption is a really essential part of, of the transition to a, a sustainable future. Now, what that means for the financial economy is a whole different subject, and we don't have time to go into that today. But it's it's going to have powerful impacts, and and uh, we, uh, you know, if if Wall Street and the, the folks who work for Wall Street in the halls of of Congress continue to uh, to run the show, you know, that that's going to uh, really turn us away from the direction we need to go uh, in, in terms of, of downsizing our economic, our, our energy and material throughput. Um, yeah, I, Helen, do you, want to, do you want to say something I, quickly before we go to the, the next question? No, that's all right. Let's go to the next question. OK. Um, a, a lot of people have been asking about Trump voters and and their situation and slash mindset. Um, uh, one person asked, uh, "What is what is the root cause of so many people allowing leaders like Trump and and even to an extent Hillary Clinton and other elites um, to rise to power?" Uh, and and another person is raising the concern that too rosy a picture might be being painted of Trump voters. Do we really think they are all small farmers struggling to sell <laughs> produce? <laughs> well, no. I if you could address those points. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a, a, a large spectrum of Trump supporters from, you know, overt misogynist, racist, xenophobes, all the way to, you know, folks who are just dissatisfied with the way things are going and just thought, well, you know, this guy's different. Let's shake things up. How could it how could it be worse than the status quo? Well, they're about to find out. 
<laughs> not that the status quo is all that great, as we've been saying, you know, in terms of, of uh, global trade policies and Wall Street and all the rest. But um, Donald, you know, Donald Trump is also a salesman. I mean, that's he's he's a realist real estate developer. And he's he's been successful at that because he is able to project an image that uh, uh, people find attractive. And he's also honed his skills in in television in, in reality television in the celebrity apprentice. He he finds ways to say things that people want to hear and often in very ambiguous ways. So if you try to pin down what he's actually saying, it's very difficult. But but it appeals to people, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of a lot of Americans don't have uh, highly developed critical thinking skills. I mean, that's not something that that ad advertisers like to promote. So they they've become ripe for the kinds of messages that Donald Trump promotes. Um, so that you know, that's just a, a, a few words. But you know, it's it's a wide range of people for a lot of different reasons. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I I think that the um, I see that someone was commenting on how it's not just about local food. We need to look at union jobs, and uh, I just do want to stress that we are heading towards crisis. I think we we need to be really alert to the fact that between the unstable climate and the unstable financial system. We need to be preparing for emergency and keep in mind that if your road is blocked because of either political instabilities or climatic ones, the first thing that's going to be on people's mind is food. You know, it's well documented that the food in the supermarket is likely to run out within three days. So there is, a, there is an emergency aspect to this focus on local food. And I remember you, Richard, you were looking also at the, you know, the realities of farming and how we need more people on the land. And you were, you know, estimating that we needed something like 10 million farmers, if I recall correctly. It was actually, it was uh, actually 50 million in the United States. Oh, was it 50 million? You were, yeah. Million, and I, yeah I, I, I wrote an a, a article to, with, that, with that title. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I'm sure you haven't changed your position on that. We need more farmers. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a, it becomes much clearer when you work in the non-industrialized world, how the destruction of the farmer is fundamental to social breakdown, to unemployment, to pollution. And so a healthy balance between city and country is what we must be striving for. And right now the imbalance in terms of food production is the most frightening and, and okay. contributing, you know, the industrial agriculture contributes more to climate change than any other sector. Yeah. Um, also, um, young farmers, very, very important. Uh, you know, the average age of an American farmer in the United States is 55 or, or higher. Uh, so it's really important that we find ways to encourage and enable young people to take up this very honorable career of, of farming. And there are young farmers organizations like the Greenhorns that, um, you know, are, are devoted to, you know, local food systems, organic production. And where they run into roadblocks is in access to land. So those of us who are older and maybe uh, control some some wealth uh, or some real estate, I think, need to be thinking about how we can use some of those assets to actually make it possible for idealistic and motivated young people to embark on, on the most honorable career there is, feeding people. And there, are, and there are very good examples of local communities coming together and recognizing the importance of this and creating a fund using different mechanisms, but essentially local people pooling their funding to create an opportunity to start those kinds of really healthy businesses. And again, particularly food. So there are community funds that have helped to sometimes give an interest-free loan, other times very low interest. 
and sometimes the funds are raised from you know very small donations but once we change the i to a we and we start looking at what can we do jointly it's amazing how many opportunities open up so in the last five, five minutes or so that we have, I think we can get through maybe one or two rapid fire questions. Um, so uh, first one is, when we're talking about localization, how can we avoid being accused of protectionism? Through an international perspective, understanding that what we're talking about here is the right and the necessity for every region, every country to be able to protect its environment and its labor force from the abuse of rampant corporate uh, exploitation. Uh, so through an international perspective, it becomes very clear that we're not talking about a protectionism that is detrimental to other communities or other countries. We're talking about a protectionism vis-a-vis -vis this very exploitative global economic system. That's a great answer. <laughs> and another question is, get these issues into the so-called mainstream media. Um, I guess, yeah. how can we turn, turn the mainstream media eye towards these issues? Well, there, there, there are lots of ways. I mean, uh, often it's easier to do that again at the local level, you know, the local newspaper, local radio, local television is going to be much more open to these kinds of stories than, you know, if you if you try to attract the attention of CNN or Fox News or uh, BBC even, it's it's uh, the, the, the getting entry to those gates is is really um, formidable, but uh, you know often stories that end up on those national outlets start at at a local level, and if it's an interesting story, if it resonates with a lot of people, then it it bubbles up. And I think there's also the need to be quite skeptical about those ideas that get wings in the mainstream media. Almost always they're, they're suspect. So at the moment, I think we should be very skeptical about what comes out of the mainstream media. And part of the education as activism is to really you know, alert ourselves to that. However, obviously, if we can get into mainstream media, all the better. But as Richard was saying, uh, starting with community radio and local papers and using worthwhile internet sites and internet media. Also there we have to be a bit critical and a bit skeptical, but using all avenues really of getting knowledge out is what, what we need to be doing. And I love some of the young um, initiatives that will use, for instance, you know, rap music or poetry or theater, you know, there's some very creative ways also of making it fun and at the same time opening eyes and educating people. Well, um, I'm, I'm just seeing what time it is and I have to go put my chickens in. <laughs> of course. Yeah, it, it's, it's time for us to end, unfortunately. Uh, sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. Uh, hopefully most of your concerns were addressed. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Richard and Helena and, of course, all of our participants for making this discussion happen. Uh, I will send an email very soon to everyone here with a recording of the webinar on YouTube and a transcript of the chat um, because a lot of great discussion was going on in the chat while uh, Richard and Helena were having their discussion here. Um, and we'll be back next year with another couple of webinars, um, including one in February with Bill McKibben. So stay tuned. Uh, you'll get an email about that as well once all the details are set. Um, and finally, if you enjoyed the webinar, please spread the word about our Global to Local series to your friends and your communities. And um, the best way to stay in touch with us is by going to localfutures.org and signing up for our monthly updates. Uh, and fi uh, finally, one more thing. Uh, someone in the chat raised the possibility of, or, or raised, uh, raised the point that there was a lot of uh, great discussion going on in the chat, and they wanted to maybe stay in touch with other people on this webinar. So if you're interested in, in sharing your email with other people here, um, send me an email to outreach at localfutures.org. Uh, I'm 
going to write that in the chat here. And uh, I'll see about putting you in touch with each other so you can continue this discussion on your own time. Uh, so thanks again, yeah, everyone. Have, have a, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Helena. <laughs> I want to thank you for doing such an excellent job. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you, Sean. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye. It, it was, it was great, great to listen to the discussion. I uh, just want to wish everyone a happy new year, and uh, we hope to stay in touch with all of you. Thanks.